Thank you everyone so much for being here tonight and our second of the Know Your Community series. We're very uh, excited to have Patty Beagle here to talk about the New Harmony Farmers and Artisans Market as presented by the WMI. I was going to give her a big flowery introduction, but she said, I can introduce myself. <laughs> so without further ado, and she's a little nervous, so let's give her a big <laughs> WMI for <laughs> Patty Beagle. She does yoga, she does teaching, she does soaps and vegetables and crops. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks, Ryan. I told Ryan, uh, I felt sorry for our cameraman, I'm gonna be a moving target because when I get nervous, I kinda pace, so you guys have to, I'm gonna it keep you up. It more interesting. It does, very good, very good. Well, <laughs> well, welcome everybody, and thank you for showing up tonight. I. Uh, Patty Beagle. I am uh, a market master at the New Harmony Farmers and Artisans Market. I've been a market master. I'm just starting my third year. So at the beginning of the, uh, or at the end of the presentation, I will have a question and answer period. If I don't have the answers, I will get them for you um, because I'm a little new at this. And it's kind of a moving target. The farmer's market, the requirements, the regulations are changing all the time, which I will talk about a little bit in this presentation. So let's start with a little bit of market history here. We started the farmer's market in 1999. Uh, Lisa Castleberry, Claudia Elliott, Rosie Benton, and Becky Gray, you might, you might recognize some of those names up there. Uh, Rosie and Becky were kind of in charge of all the legwork, but I interviewed Becky <coughs> for the sake of this presentation because she is, is still with us as a market vendor. And she said it was kind of really casual. We said, hey, will you do this? And they said, yes. And will you do this? And they said, yes. Um, so the market really wasn't uh, very set in their rules and what their requirements were at the beginning. There wasn't any formal, formalized leadership. These women got together and decided we needed a market and they started one. It was first presented at Elliott Farms, which is, and who lives there now? Is it? Well, when he's there, John um, Jeffries. Jeffries. John Jeffries. Okay, thank you. I didn't. Claudia's husband. Okay, all right. Okay, so they were on that location for about two years, and then after that, they moved to North Main in between uh, the Roofless Church and the Red Geranium. And they were there for a number of years. Who participated? In a lot of ways, at that time, the market looked pretty similar to our market now. They had musicians, kind of like we have now. Uh, Mr. Reynolds played the banjo and the guitar, and he would sing. Uh, they had vendors from all around the tri-state, from Illinois. Uh, now, we kind of go with a 75-mile radius. You have to be within that radius and produce any food crops within that radius. Uh, they had several truck farmers who came and they would bring sweet corn, tomatoes. We don't have uh, as many truck farmers now because we, um, on, at one point, we had someone who would bring melons and it really kind of hurt the smaller vendors to have big groups like that. So we kind of uh, discouraged that. They also use banners to advertise. We have a banner that recently has been put out uh, near the park, and we have seen a marked increase in our traffic coming from the park, from the campground. We have a lot of uh, participants come in there. A lot of visitors come from the campground. Some of the differences were they would pay their dues weekly. They would pay $5 a week in order to participate um, and if they, I really loved this when Becky told me this, they had the option to waive dues. If you had a rainy day or if you had a yucky day or nobody showed up, they would just say, okay, you don't have to pay this week. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't do business that way anymore because we have insurance costs and, and marketing costs, but I kind of like that idea of, oh, I'm having a bad day, I'm not paying today. Um, and they would advertise in the newspaper, and we predominantly use social media for our advertising now. 
Okay, more recent history. Ten years ago, they were located in the location Caddy Corner from Sarah's. You know, I have lived in New Harmony for eight years, and I don't know the names of places. I never was very good about that. But you know where I'm talking about. It's right over there. <laughs> we just say, oh, it's over there. It's that park there. It's, yeah. So, um, what is it called? McClure Square. McClure Square. Thank you. I knew you were there. There's my timekeeper for my yoga class. He's going to keep me on track tonight. <laughs> um, and after they were there for a period of time, they moved to the USI property that's right across the street here. Um, the big maple trees provided a lot of shade. It was a straight line. It was a, for a while, it was a really good venue. Um, and at that time, they also formal, formalized the rules and regulations as well as what the obligations a market master had to do. And I might just say that now we have four market masters, which sounds kind of like a lot for the size of our market, but we kind of split up the duties. Uh, I'm unofficially known as the town liaison. I'm the one who goes to the town council or goes to the WMI and does things like this. That's how I uh, found my place in the, in the market hierarchy. Okay, so current history. COVID-19 kind of wrecked everybody's world. That year we had some big changes. There were changes to the requirements for vendors and customers. You may remember when we had our tent set up and we had to put the ribbon around the outside edge so that you couldn't get close, you couldn't pick things up, you couldn't touch things. Uh, we were wearing masks at the time. Um, USI closed their location. At one point, USI's location would only allow 10 people at a time to congregate. So we couldn't, there was no way we could control the number of people who would come to the market. So we were essentially without a place to be for a while. Um, during that time period, I hosted the market in my yard a couple of times and it was very successful. So that kind of motivated us to find a place. So we presented this to the WMI, thank you very much, and they graciously uh, thought it was a great idea and invited us to participate here on their property. It has been a wonderful, wonderful working partnership. Other than the bare spots, we, we'll, we'll get out there and seed the grass. We, we're worried about that. We, it's, it's on our radar, just letting you know. <laughs> um, just the layout that we're able to have, we've been able to expand a little bit because we've had a lot of requests from people who want to join the market. We're, we are always looking for new people, but we have to be kind of limited in that, and I will let you know what some of those things we're looking for are later in the presentation. But it's been a really great working partnership and uh, we hope it continues. <laughs> okay, so what are we doing today? We offer an opportunity to purchase locally sourced fruits, vegetables, pickles, jams, textiles, soap, and artwork. Uh, it's also an opportunity for local vendors to display their art and sell their produce to an appreciative market. We also provide, and I like to say this probably because of my location in the market lineup, I'm in the booth at the very beginning and I end up telling a lot of visitors what to see in New Harmony. Why is New Harmony so important? What is, you know, where are you from? What are you, you know, what are you here for? Kind of a liaison with the, <laughs> with the tourist board, um, giving people information about New Harmony. Um, as well as the state park. We have people from all over the state, from St. Louis, from Indianapolis. Uh, people come from all over to visit New Harmony. There are people who come and who have uh, visited here regularly, and lo and behold, they end up moving here. So I think it's a great, you know, it's a great community, and, and we provide a service in, in marketing this community. We're also talking about a tree project. We're gonna be doing a fundraiser this year in order to raise money to replace some trees. Maybe not in the same location, but plant some trees. I know you all have heard the tree trucks. I always go out and look and see where the tree trucks are working when I hear them. 
because we're, we're losing some of our trees and we would like to give back to the community in this way, planting, planting trees. Um, another thing we did last year was uh, a $20 market certificate in an effort to bring people in. Uh, we uh, gave away gift certificates, did a raffle on Facebook. Um, we're also going to do a neighborhood campaign and we're going to do little handbills that we can drop off on people's porches uh, so that they know about the farmer's market. There are a lot of people in town and I've heard every time I hear this I think really they didn't know about the farmer's market. Well what do you have there? Well when? When is the farmer's market? Well what, what do you do? And so I think just making ourselves more visible to the town is one of our goals for this year. Okay, so we provide local music. Randy Pease and John Martin perform for us. Now, let's see. Some moved away. Some stayed home. Some went to college. Some went to Nam. Some remain. Some are gone from the class 71 so raise your classmates to all your classmates those who remain those who've moved on we made some memories we so um, they're usually there every Saturday, so if you want to come out and just enjoy the music, you're more than welcome to. It's uh, been great to have them uh, participate in the market. It just kind of, I think it contributes just to the feeling of our market. I know you've all probably been to other farmers markets. Ours are a really intimate, small group, and I think it has a really good welcoming vibe, and I think that these guys really help promote that. Okay, another thing that we offer is a place to encourage young artists. We do have an introductory offer for students under 17 to begin to display their work. It's always encouraging when you're able to sell your artwork. This is Natalie Nanitor and she has been with us. I'm not sure she's even going to be back this year. I think she's a senior or a freshman because just watching her art evolve and just watching the people in the town support her work and purchase from her has been really, really cool. Okay, now my favorite part, the rules and regulations. And boy, never go look things up unless you really want to find out what they say and then you just kind of want to say let's close the laptop and not pay any attention to this um we take our rules and regulations from the indiana farmers market community of practice uh this is an entity that's made up of six different groups the cooperative development center the farm bureau department of ag Indiana Grown, I really like their website. If you ever have a chance and you have a lot of time on your hand and you want to just look at it, their uh, mission is to keep Indiana food dollars in the state by promoting connections between farmers and consumers. The cool thing about this is they gave some statistics. They said about $8 billion Indiana Hoosiers spend on their food and only about 10% of it goes to Indiana produced products, which is crazy to me. So they're really big in helping to promote these connections between the small farmer, the farmer's market, and locally sourced food. Uh, the Indiana Department of Health, my least favorite one, my least favorite <laughs> bit of research I did because it's like, ooh, I really don't want to know this. Um, they are responsible for and I will get to this, there's some changes coming down the pike for us. Uh, they're responsible for the safe servers training, which isn't in existence yet. So I'll explain a little bit more about that and, and the Purdue Extension. Okay, this is the website. If you're interested, there's more than enough information about the do's and don'ts for the farmer's market. I, it's interesting to me 
that on the one hand, they want to promote this, but on the other hand, they cut you off at the knees by the regulations that are in place for it. And I'll talk a little bit more about those when we talk about some of the requirements we have now. Okay, so what, under a big umbrella, what does it talk about? It talks about labels. Okay, as a vendor at the market, we have to label all of our products with the name and address, the list of ingredients, um, and the statement about our kitchens not being uh, inspected by the health department. Okay, so that is pretty much understandable. You have to have tents. If you have food products, you have to have them covered. Uh, you also have to have elevation requirements. This was one I wasn't aware of. You can't put food on the ground. You have to make sure it's 30 inches, at least 30 inches up off the ground if you're going to sell food. Um, uh, the categories for home-based food vendor items and the specific requirements for each, baked goods, canned goods, honey and eggs, honey and eggs, maple syrup and sorghum they have their own set of rules that you have to follow in order to be able to produce and sell them the other ones this is the part that they have recently passed a bill that will be enacted that will be enforced in july of 2022 this is the one that i think we're going to have to make some changes to the market um, and then ready to eat items we had a vendor one time who was doing uh uh, drinks, beverages. I don't know whether she will be back, but we did have a request one time for somebody to do kebabs and they wanted to cook them and give them. And I think she found that it was so prohibitive that, and the market so small that it wasn't going to be worth her while to do that. Okay, so these are the new developments that I was talking about. The Indiana Department of Health proposed and passed House Bill number 1149. It's going to require everybody to have a food handler certification, okay? Well, um, used to be there was a requirement for this, but one person at the market would go through the certification and then that would cover the whole market. Because if there's a question, they were able to say, you know, well, let's ask so-and-so because they understand about this. I think now anybody who does, uh, who is a home-based vendor is going to have to take this. Um, the only problem is, and I can say this because I worked in higher education for years, I think the state is really good about saying, we're going to do this, but I don't know how we're going to assess it, and I don't know how we're going to train people, and I don't know how we're going to do We don't know that yet. Um, so I have heard there is a safe server course out there. So far, it's $150 a person to take it. I think that's going to really hurt vendors in the market. I don't think people are going to take it. They have not come up with the food handler certification that they are going to require for this new bill. So hopefully this year we can continue as we did last year. Now in the future, you know, stay tuned. We'll find out. Um, Home-based home high-risk products, that's going to cover just about everything. Baked goods, pickles, jams, everything. So that's something that we're going to have to revisit. Labeling, it's going to require what I have already spoken to you about, as well as the data production, which I don't think is a bad thing because in the market we do have some problems with people taking stuff home and freezing it and bringing it back. And I think this will eliminate that problem. Uh, weight, you're going to have to do the weight. You're also going to have to say, and sorry for the typo, this product is home produced and processed and the production area has not been inspect inspected by the state health department. That's very similar to what we have now. Not for resale is new. So in other words, if you go and buy something somewhere else, you can't bring it to the market and resell it. Why does it have to say not for resale on that thing though? Because that would imply the customer can't resell it. Well, I don't think, I didn't think that they are considered ready to eat for the consumer to buy and eat. Not to go to the farmer's market and buy Becky's cookies and then take them to the church bake sale and resell them. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that's exactly what they need. Okay. Meet our vendors. All right. Uh, this is Laura Nicholson. Uh, and... Feel free to change if I have. I just put a few things up there. If there's anything I missed, let me know. 
I do want to point out in the baked goods and granola area, Tom, who is right there, does a wonderful almond cake if you haven't tried it. And if we can get him to make it again, we need to have that. And you need to, it's, it's wonderful. It's got about nine pounds of butter per cake. So it's, it's, it's delightful. Um, but Laura, you've all seen her work, screen printed towels, sachets, t-shirts, purses, uh, as well as her granola that she made. The Kiwanis, the re I would like to just mention that the Kiwanis, we do have uh, limited space available for people who are doing fundraisers. And we do allow the Kiwanis because they do help our community and they donate back to the community. They, everything that they sell, they, they donate to the Kiwanis and so we allow them to set up as well with us. This is Mary McGrew. How long has Mary been at the market? I don't Forever, okay, <laughs> close enough. Um, she and her sons have a really big garden. She's probably our biggest produce producer. Um, she also has jams and jellies and some handmade sewn objects uh, and pickles. She, she's one who always has a lot of the produce. Becky, I talked about Becky earlier, I don't have her name up there. She does jams and jellies and handmade decorative items. She also has fabulous cookies in her booth. If you haven't tried them, you should. They're pretty good. Sarah Browning, she's one of the market, current market masters. They have tomatoes and seasonal vegetables, flowers, handmade cards, wreaths, and baked goods. Her sister Ellie is quite a seamstress, and she is here and displays with Sarah as well, and her daughter Ellen helps us with our marketing. She comes to the market master meeting sometimes with suggestions about you know, what we can do for fundraisers and, and some marketing ideas. Tisa's Foolish Fancies, these uh, Barb Kearney and Tisa Gallup come from uh, Grayville. And Tisa does the woodworking. If you haven't had a close look at her woodworking, it's fantastic. It's really quite creative and artistic. Barb does the baskets, and, and their products are wonderful for gifts. Um, it's just very, very highly crafted materials. Uh, Ken and Susie Shooty, I cut off their sign. This was from Leather Leaf Inn. I don't know whether they're going to be displaying with us this year because the, I guess because COVID is over, the Leather Leaf Inn is getting busier. Uh, Saturday morning's a big morning for breakfast, getting it all done and getting to the market. They're not sure yet whether or not they're going to participate, but they have produce and baked goods. Steve Cochran is a market master. He has vegetables, uh, dried herbs, handmade paper products, canned goods, and locally sourced foods. Steve will go to uh, Farview Orchard and get apples and bring them in and resell them. That's another one that's going to be a gray area in the coming years. We don't know whether we're going to be able to do that, but he is willing to go to different places and bring things in that None of us have an apple orchard in our backyard, so he kind of goes and fills in those spaces. Peggy Taylor from Loom Hall, I'm sure you've seen her if you've been to the market out uh, demonstrating. Yeah, she's, she's all over. Um, demonstrating, uh, she also has beautiful scarves and table runners and woven items that we, our artisans are really Highly, highly, I mean, their, their stuff is very nice. I'm just, just saying. Of course, I'm next, so of course, I just had to say that before I got to my slide, right? Um, uh, my daughters do baking, they call it twins hand baking. We also have pickles, painted items, and produce. Couldn't find a picture of Scott Lamar, he's the other market master who has kind of been at this now for nine years, I believe, he told me, maybe 11, I'm not sure exactly, I can't remember now exactly how many years. Um, I'm sure you've seen his uh, soaps, his goat's milk soap, uh, lotions, he has CBD lotion. It really, really works on your achy joints, trust me, it's really, it's pretty good. Um, but they also have bug spray. He. Uh, is always at the market unless he's got another show that he has to do, and, and at that point, you might have to wait a week. 
This is a new vendor, Mark McDonald. He does barn art. He does the painted Pennsylvania Dutch barn quilts. When he first wanted to do this, we kind of thought, I don't know what the market's like for that, but he actually had a really good year last year, and so he will be back this year. And Kaya Hawthorne, she was there for about half the season, had beautiful pies, did a really good job with that, but I think her schooling kind of had a, she had conflicts with that, so she was only there for part of the year, Not haven't heard whether or not she's going to be back. And Abby Held will be back. She's got herbal teas, dried herbs. Her husband's going to be joining her this year and have his own booth. He's going to have produce because they have a urban garden in Evansville, and so he's going to be another produce vendor for us. Okay, so if you're interested in joining us, this is some of the, this is some of the information I want to impart to you. It's going to be $40 per year. We eliminated the per market option. We used to offer that for a new vendor just to kind of test drive it, see how it went for them. Maybe the market was going to be a good idea for them, maybe not, but it got to be a real nightmare figuring out where everybody was going to go and, okay, so-and-so said they were going to be here. We saved a spot for them and they didn't show up. So it's $40 regardless of when you join. Attendance is highly encouraged. Um, we really want consistency. If you bring a product to the market and you're, not, you're there one week and then you're gone for three weeks, as a matter of fact, I think in our introductory level, letter, we say that you know if you miss three in a row and nobody knows why, you will forfeit your right to be in the market. Um, it's a commitment. It's a long time. This year we are waiting till the middle of October, or I'm sorry, the middle of May, so that we have uh, a little bit more produce coming in than last year. We started in April and it got to be a really long time by the end of October. The October date is kind of up in the air. It depends on how gardens are doing. If you end up with a drought, you know, in August and September, then chances are good we won't be here in October. But if it's a beautiful fall, like two years ago, we may be. It just kind of, that depends. There will be ex assigned spaces, but expect to move around a little bit. Because like I said, while attendance is highly encouraged, Everybody's got summer plans and everybody's got prior commitments and family members that they have to, uh, you may not be there for every single one and so the, you gotta be a little bit fluid about where your spot is and preference is given to vendors who've been there for years, obviously. Duplicate policy, this is one that, <laughs> this, is the part of the, this is the part of the job I hate. We have a lot of people who contact us and say, hey, I want to uh, join the market. I want to bring eggs, and I want to bring baked goods, and I want to bring soap. And I say, well, we already have two egg vendors. We already have four baked good vendors. We already have a soap vendor. We'll put you on a wait list simply because, because of the size of our market, we can't have too many duplicates, then nobody does very well in the market. Another thing that we've run into, and I think this is because of COVID, everybody is looking for a uh, side gig and everybody wants to come to the market and sell whatever. We are getting a little bit more rigorous in our jurying what they're bringing. We are an artisan's market, so if you want to bring Tervis tumblers with pictures of your dog in it, we're going to say, I'm sorry, that's really not what we're looking for. Um, anything processed like that, like, you know, Lucite keychains and things like that, we're kind of trying to limit that and, and give precedence more to the artists. Um, there's also a formalized violation policy. I, I, we haven't had to use it. I hope we never have to use it. But on occasion, there are people who we, we're really requesting that when you apply for the market, you tell us exactly what you're going to bring. And if you come up with something new, you have to have it cleared by the market master so we can uh, eliminate the duplication thing or eliminate the, no, I'm sorry, this isn't going to work, especially with these new rules coming out. It's going to be a lot more work, and we're going to have to be much more diligent about keeping track of what's coming in. And so if there's a violation, there's a warning, and there, yeah, but we won't get that far, right? 
<laughs> okay. Does anybody have any questions about anything? So what are you missing? What are we missing? Not that I can provide. Okay. <laughs> You know what? We have a honey vendor. We have we have a lot of things. We're always looking for produce. We um, and new and unique. What I've told people, like my daughters who are interested in the baking, I said, "Well, go to." They live over in Elberfeld. I said, "Go to the Boonville Market. See what they offer. Look around and see what is available and what you might." be interested in contributing. We're always looking for, you know, new arts, crafts, things that people have taken time with and done nicely because we do, you know, I do those painted bird eggs and little painted things and I do sell at the market, that kind of thing. Uh, people are looking for gifts, things like that, but produce is the big one. We won't say no if you have produce because Everybody anticipates that in the middle of July, they're going to be six tons of tomatoes out here in front of the WMI, and that's just anticipated. You know, I had somebody ask me sometime, well, can't you kind of space things out? And I'm like, yeah, no, we can't. Um, that's yeah, just the way. Show off May 1st and say, where are the tomatoes? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, you want lettuce? You want radishes? We can do, you. do, do that. Any other questions? What exactly is a market master? Oh, good question. It's a jack of all trades. Um, <laughs> these are the people who are in charge of making the application, sending out the application, doing the marketing, determining who is going to be able to display in the market. Uh, Scott, like I said, he's done this for years. He has contacts in the county. He's probably going to be the one who gets all the information for this safe server certification thing. My thing is New Harmony. You know, going. I'll probably be very. I'll probably be walking around the neighborhoods, dropping off pamphlets on people's front porches. Um, Steve does a lot of the the clerical. Um, uh, Sarah as well, she's kind of taken over the Facebook thing, which I'm very proud of her for because I, because I kind of dropped the ball on that. Um, so Sarah does Facebook and marketing type things. We kind of, it's kind of like I said, like it started. We share things and it, it's also one of those jobs which I'm sure everybody's familiar with that it's like, do you want to do this? No, I don't know, do you want to do this? <laughs> so it's kind of like that as well. Yeah. But I, I mean, I've been involved with this and I was a market master so I'm not just shooting my mouth off, but you also have the very important task of making sure that the food is sold is safe. And that, like I said, is going to get harder and there are going to be hurt feelings and there, I mean, there are products in my booth that probably will no longer be able to be sold. So mm -hmm. it's, that's going to be a tough one. Because especially for people who've been there for nine, 10, 11 years, well, why not? Well, why can't I? Well, you know, the state has said we can't. And if we're in violation, they could come in and shut us down. So, Patty, is, um, I'm sure you're in touch with people like at the Bloomington market and other large markets. Isn't this going to be a terrible problem if people have to get the certification? You know, I mean, isn't that going to wipe out? Yes, especially the small ones. I know Posey County is trying, or Poseyville is trying to start one. Wadesville, you know, they have six vendors at the most at a time. I think it is. I think it's going to be very detrimental for people unless the state steps up and finds a way that says, you know, hey, we're offering the Farm Bureau is offering this, or the or Purdue Extension is offering this course. Show <coughs> up. There's no fee involved. Right. Just no fee. right. Absolutely. Right, and it's just, then the onus is going to be on the individual. If you want to bake bread and sell it at the market, you're going to have to go to this safe service. The other thing is you can you do your baking and your canning and your pickling at a commercial kitchen. How easy is that? You know, it's just not, yeah, I know. It, it, like I said, it's kind of this, this, you're shooting yourself in the foot by saying, we want this in Indiana, but we're going to make this really hard. And I can understand that probably what happened was somebody got sick, something happened, and then you have to 
put out these rules, but by the same token, it, it is going to limit people's availability to this kind of thing. Any other questions? And what are the hours of the market? The, thank you. <laughs> you know, that was a little a bit important. It's Saturday morning from 9 to 12, and thank you for asking that because I've had people show up and this is sometimes local people because I get it, I would love to sleep in too, but they show up at 10.30, well, how come this is gone? It says that you had this and you had, and I said, well, you know, I, I was sold out at 9.30. So being here early is probably a good thing, particularly at the beginning of the year when the new stuff is just coming in and I may have two bags of lettuce or, you know, four tomatoes that I can sell, so it, it, it's really, being here early is probably a good thing. A lot of people show up at age. Yes, and I know that the Franklin Street Market says, Bzzzt, and they really they have a bell they ring, and you cannot sell ahead of time. And we have kicked that around because that makes really, you know, people who get up at 5 o'clock every day are there, but the people who don't get up that early are, it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, I heard you sold to so-and-so and they were here at 8.30, how'd that happen? So, I don't know, we'll, we, we, we haven't really talked about that. I better put that on our agenda for our next Market Masters meeting. Well, thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. And thank you, Brian. Well, trustees need some recognition in that as well. Yes. It is uh, certainly uh, very proud to have the uh, be the location for the, the farmers market. Um, you know, staff, or members, or trustees all very proud to have that. Certainly, it helps the, the visitation numbers here at the Working Men's Institute. And it's so nice on a Saturday morning to to see so many people here. The, the parking spaces are all full, and people coming in. And of course, I've been a, a loyal shopper at the market too as well so just it's thank you for for thinking of us when you were looking for another uh, location thank you so <laughs> know your community series we're going to keep this going on may 11th kent shooting is going to be here talking about uh, the blaffer foundation i want to know what, what the heck they do and on june 29th Annie cook from the ford home will be talking about that that really is a jewel of New Harmony. I spent the afternoon with Amy uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, getting an in-and-out tour of the Ford home. Such a lovely facility. We're very, very lucky to have a, an institution like that here in New Harmony. So please come for that. Other lectures that we have, uh, May 12th, Karen Moser, uh, the award winner of the, uh, the grant recipient of the uh, uh, Lena, Fire, Lena Finer Memorial Research Grant. She's going to be talking about teen girls then and now. That's May 12th. Well, um, if you're interested in that grant, there's still a few more days to get your application in for this year. So if you're interested, in see me, check out our website. Uh, May 18th, Friends of the Working Men's Institute, uh, Rod Clark. Anybody know that guy? <laughs> He's going to be talking about whiskey. Now, is that EY or just Y? Okay. We're going to, we're going to, we're, you're going to have to show up and find out, right? Are you going to do samples? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So also down the pipeline in, in May, we have a very special Memorial Day program. Uh, Nathan Marvin, Vice President of the Working Men's Institute, is going to be talking about the D-Day invasion, um, at Utah Beach. Um, be a very special program here for that. Uh, June 8th, Connie Weinzappel is going to be talking about France during COVID or why she loves the frogs. So <laughs> 6.30 p.m., uh, all those events, come see us at the Working Men's Institute. Thank you so much. <laughs>